Let me tell you a story, pun intended. About 15 years ago, my artists and I started the largest English language webcomic network in the world. At one point, we had over 70,000 daily readers across all our titles. My comics alone generated well over a million page views from nearly 190,000 readers. Keep in mind, we didn't have the technology then that we have now. The iPhone was only a year old. There were no tablets, no e-readers. We didn't have a big office building or a staff of hundreds. It was all desktop PC. We didn't have anything close to contemporary social media, but we did combine comics and the internet. Two things that were practically made for each other. And what we learned was true then is still true today. We're creating a whole new kind of storytelling. And if we succeed, we will change the world. Take a look at getabook.today. If we sell one book a day from our store, it makes all the difference. Just one book is all it takes. It frees up enough artist time and enough scriptwriter time to do what most people think is impossible. It's even easier now than before. It helps us build momentum. It allows us to make plans for the future. Be the guy or gal who buys today's book and I guarantee you someone from our audience will be inspired by what you do and step up to buy tomorrow's book. Make it a gift if you like. Try something new because when we string all those sales together we will be building the bridge to something unimaginably cool. It will be even better than the comic network. It's where all the best news stories will come from. I write in six different genres. I know tons of other authors who are far more talented than I. They're all waiting to be set free. One book a day is all it takes. You'll be able to say you were there when it all began. Be there for us, and we'll be there for you. Say it with me. All ahead, battle speed. Blackout. Get a book dot today presents Alert Force, book five in the Starship Expeditionary Fleet series by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2019. Chapter 4, Combat Space Patrol Viking 4, El Rey System Perimeter, Section 10. Lieutenant Commander Desiree Danger Baby Shaw Commanding. Argent Control, this is Jack Lead. I am tracking 6, correction 7 marks at 210. Request permission to arm. The fighters of Patrol V-4 were flying in a tight diamond slot formation approaching the trailing course of Cavalier 5 Heavy. All of Argent's patrol formations were gradually converging on what the battleship's combat information center had detected near the system's edge. One of the things Hunter and O'Malley both had gotten into the habit of doing was launching autonomous probes to supplement their eyes and ears at medium ranges relative to their ship's course. Without her battle group, a ship like Argent was tasked with maintaining her own defensive perimeter. One of the things she was more than capable of provided her captain and XO were Max attentive to the potential for shenanigans. Given the events of the past two weeks, it could be reasonably said that pretty much everyone aboard Skywatch Hull BBV-740 was Max attentive. Both command officers were well aware Commander Drake's formation was in harm's way. His was a mission that required little more than time, so it was up to Argent to make sure something hostile didn't sneak up on him in the dark. Jason was in his full element. He was maintaining brisk conversations with at least three departments while working with his chief signals officer to brainstorm more ideas about where an enemy carrier might be hiding in or near the El Rey system. Turns out whatever attacked Task Force 92 was a Sarn Wildcat equivalent, Hunter said. Energy batteries, good acceleration, top-of-the-line electronic warfare suite. According to the repeater data, their first wave was only 15,000 miles out when the threat board tripped. Sounds to me like someone was looking the other way, Zoni replied. Either that or they were too confused by the loss of signal from the repeater matrix. You know, I have a thought about that, Jason said as he pushed off from the center chair and cleared all three steps to the communications station. Doesn't it seem to you these guys are doing a look over there every time they launch a fighter strike? Same thing happened at Uniform Tango, remember? Zoni meant it as an offhand remark, but for the captain, suddenly everything fell into place. 
Zoni looked up. What? It can't have been that well coordinated. Zoni recognized the hunter look. It was the one both Jason and his sister got when they were about to do something intuitive, potentially reckless and entirely hunter-like in its conception and execution. The captain bounded back to the con and grabbed the white handset from the overhead console. Launch gargoyle and stuffy on the ready alert. Rendezvous with formation Viking 4. Weapons armed, signal buster. Yes, sir, came the assured response from the Skywatch CIC. The topmost deck aboard Argent was not the bridge, but a technological marvel in the equivalent of a tower built as a superstructure on the dorsal surface of the ship. On all vessels with designated star wings, this tower was referred to as Skywatch, while the fleet headquarters was called Skywatch Command. The name had stuck over the years and eventually replaced Space Navy as the name of the military branch in charge of spacecraft. Ironically enough, the Marines ended up absorbing the remaining units of the wet Navy, which became an auxiliary service. Everything that happened at Prairie Grove happened before. It happened at Station 19. It happened when the Invector Formation tried to commandeer this vessel at Bayonne. You're saying all of those events were related somehow? Commander O'Malley asked as he straightened his glasses. A distinct possibility, Exo. And now what have we got going on in the El Rey system? A cruiser vanishes into thin air. All of my fighter pilots are suddenly in the riddle-solving business. Meanwhile, we lost contact with an enemy formation which Commander Shaw just picked up again. O'Malley moved to the navigator's console and began examining the contact trail for the unidents. They've got to have a support ship somewhere in the system. Agreed, XO, Hunter said as he joined the navigator and his second-in-command. The three officers studied the tactical readouts, looking for anything that might indicate where the unidents originated and what their eventual destination might be. Sir, Flight 3 reports the ready alert launched, vectoring 335 for V4 intercept. Very well, Hunter replied. XO, it might not be a bad idea to put together some backup for those two patrols. I'd like a nemesis out there while we're at it. If we could coordinate with Flotilla 29, it would give us a second set of eyes and ears out here. We're going to have to do some heavy reworking of our transmitters to get a signal to Captain Drake without giving away our position. Whatever Lieutenant Calloway detected is between us and them. The CSP is the priority, XO. Work with Zoni on the communications link after. Agreed, sir. Jets in five. Very well. Zoni, notify the flight leads for Cavalier 5 and Viking 4 we are prepping backups. Yolanda, plot a new course for Repeater 2's command zone. All ahead two-thirds. Affirmative, sir. Helm answering 310 Mark 6. All ahead two-thirds. Navigator, find that carrier. I'm putting you and Zoni on it. Make it happen. Chapter 5. Signals Company 11. Surface Defense Base Hudson. Sub-Level 2. Captain Liam Henkel commanding. You would be amazed at how important forgotten outposts become when there's war brewing, Captain. Liam Henkel was at a complete loss for words. To be fair, so was his commanding officer aboard the Conquistador. As far as his company corporal had known, there was only one subterranean level constructed under the Hudson base. Now it was clear there were more than one, and what his team had discovered on sublevel 2, courtesy of Dr. Franklin Harding and his daughter Alexis, was unreal enough to make the captain think he was hallucinating. Before him was a fully equipped experimental electronics research laboratory. Parked in the nearby underground flight bay was a top-of-the-line civilian survey shuttle equipped with enough instruments to give any of Skywatch's ships of the line a run for their money in terms of investigating unfamiliar regions of space. Where did you get the money to build all this? Henkel asked. Oh, a combination of grants, maintenance budgets, and a few patents my daughter and I have accumulated over the years. None of my dinner party friends understand a word of it, but I find it keeps us supplied and sheltered. We can make the upper levels appear as abandoned as we like. The salvagers and marauders have long since lost interest. Those missiles out there are just props. So, the missile strike? Waste of ammunition. We're about as militarily significant as a roadside watermelon stand, Captain. But our records still indicate this is an active defense base, Corporal Osprey interrupted, drawing a sideways glance from the captain. I gave up trying to explain our readiness situation out here five years ago, Miss Osprey. Between all the personnel changes, the bureaucratic nonsense, and now this situation with the build-up, there hasn't been two uninterrupted weeks of attention paid to this place since Alexis was in middle school. 
So I decided to take advantage of the situation and use it as a subsidized research facility. I see you've installed your own life support, Henkel said. Air pressure in here is 14.1. Walking around with artificial air supplies gets very tiring after a while. More tiring than building our own scrubbers, Alexis said. She was a girl of perhaps 18, 19 years of age who didn't look all that much like her father except for the glasses and the mannerisms. Both members of the Harding family were wearing white lab coats, of course. It was often important for academics to keep up appearances, given how easily people could be distracted by semi-relevant things like fashion. Alexis was wearing a flirty number under her coat, but then again, some things were to be expected when teenagers were concerned. She had already drawn more than her fair share of attention from Henkel's overwhelmingly male and about the same age Marines. But I have something for you, Captain, Dr. Harding said as he led Henkel and Osprey into a pleasantly lit office-like space with a desk console and a screen affixed to one wall. The doctor activated the console and brought up a tactical view of the L-Ray system on the wall screen. The view rotated using L-Ray 3 as a three-dimensional axis until it was possible to see beyond the system's primary. We have a fairly sophisticated passive tracking system for asteroids in this system, Captain. One of the things our automated instruments are geared to look for is anything that alters its course. Manned flight, Osprey said. Exactly. Our computers are programmed to calculate all of the possible gravitational effects from the six bodies large enough to require vessels to make course corrections. If one of those bodies alters the trajectory of an asteroid, it's expected. However, if an object alters its own trajectory, that means there's got to be someone at the wheel. And you found something? Henkel asked. We have historical data going back months. Whatever it is you're looking for may have started that long ago. Take a look at this. A white line extended through the system, eventually crossing behind the L. Ray star from the point of view of the Hudson base. Notice how the object's trajectory only gradually changes? Of course. Parabolic course affected only by the star and the nearby planets, Henkel said. Compare that with this. A green line appeared this time. The object navigated to a point inside the orbit of the innermost planet, then shifted course more than 40 degrees to duck behind the star. Again, the object was shielded by the L. Ray primary. What's on that side of the system? Osprey asked. Invisible to us, Henkel replied. Very good, Captain. Whoever they are, they still think this base is either manned or, at the very least, some kind of threat to their continued operations. Whatever they are doing, they want to keep it concealed. Where are you getting the data, Doctor? Osprey asked. We have intermittent contact with all the repeaters in the system. You cracked Skywatch's authorization codes? Not necessary, Alexis replied. The fleet receiver we were supplied with has all the encryption keys. Henkel studied the data for a moment. Doctor, how many objects have you tracked in system over the last six months that maneuvered on artificially maintained courses? Seven. And did all of them move to positions opposite ER3? All but one. Interesting, Osprey said. I think I know where the Sarn battle group is hiding, Henkel said. Osprey, go topside and find Peters. I want an uplink to Commander Vance on the double. Chapter 6, Imperial Bloodwing Strike Operations, Mount Tainavu, Dark Surface of El Ray 5. Once again, Hyval, we see the humans reacting in predictable ways. Second Dragon Orn, high scale of the Elder Skies, reclined upon a throne fit for an emperor. As it stood, his was an office not far from that lofty station. He presided over the Sarn ground base from a platform ten feet high, another fitting symbol of his authority. His control crew monitored four enormous flight bays and their brand new ships, all carefully hidden more than 150 feet under the rocky surface of El Ray 5. The base had been built in record time. The Sarn predilection for improvisation and mimicry had served the fleet well on this occasion. The base had a portable power supply, mobile fighter tender vehicles, and anti grav equipped storage. The entire operation had been designed as an experiment and had been treated just as disdainfully until it became clear the Empire had the technology to move a fighter squadron from place to place with nothing more complicated than a transport ship. Although the Second Dragon was not the officer who had created the idea of the pop-up fighter base, he was the officer who had championed its final phases of development in the face of opposition among competing interests in the Imperial fleet. 
The clash of priorities had been a bitter one, and like all military controversies had been rapidly distilled into a comparison of bangs for bucks. Orne's faction had compiled all the necessary charts, graphs, and reports, but as it turned out, the dispute never got that far. The second dragon recognized his opponent's fatal disadvantage as quickly as he utilized it to aggrandize his own position in the command hierarchy. The simple fact was the cost of a carrier was two orders of magnitude the cost of a transport. There was no reason to lay down the keels of capital ships if planet surfaces could be used to achieve the same goals. While it was true the Bloodwing base on El Rey V wasn't portable, that fact was easily waved aside as sauce for the goose. A fighter squadron tasked with the defense and occupation of the El Rey system didn't need to be capable of relocating itself to other systems. This was in contrast to the battle group that had destroyed Task Force 92 in the Prairie Grove system. Some of the highest-ranking Imperial officers weren't as easily convinced as the High Command had been, at least on this occasion. To be fair, Sarn fighter technology was still in its infancy. The vying factions backing choices for force and firepower projection had not yet reached a consensus. One could point to Skywatch as an example of carrier success. The other could point to the bottom line. Ultimately, it would be a test of both strategy and tactics. Orn's team was bound and determined to be the one left standing. The dragon's black and scarlet armor, numerous medals and raiment, were all as impressive as the forces at his command. He had been personally dispatched by the Imperial Castellan of Mount Arnis from the Sarn homeworld to take command of the Empire's second Bloodwing strike force. Around him were gathered six full squadrons of the Empire's newest and most savage pilots. They were all eager to engage the humans and show them how far their fighter technology and battle tactics had come. Orn knew they wouldn't have to wait long. The human commander is cautious, Second Dragon. He does not approach, but sends small bands of scouts to take readings and gather information. Skywatch has many electronic tools. If we are discovered... Do not fear the humans and their caution, old friend. Remember the ancient story of the dragon who lay in wait. Third-scale Hyval was not as confident as his commander. He had been intimately involved in the recently undertaken fighter experiments and was well aware of the limits of the technology. He was also an amateur scholar of human history, and he was also well aware of the advent of air power in the ancient wars. The difference between then and now was that humans didn't have beam weapons with ranges of tens of thousands of miles to defend against fighter attacks in ancient times. Now they not only had such weapons, but they were mounted on their own fighters. Fables and tales of long ago can be instructive, provided we are equally cautious. Despite the gradual coalescence of his plans, Orn was becoming impatient. He was close to the Emperor's inner circle. While his high rank gave him clout, it also came with its own pressure to succeed. The El Rey mission was designed to neutralize the planetary base. If he could return home with news of the destruction of the starship Argent, or even better return home with the ship herself intact, he would have limitless opportunities. The Tainavu base was just as experimental as the new Sarn fighter initiative. To hear the Imperial subjects talk, the idea of ferrying squadrons of fighters aboard carriers would forever be a technology mastered by the humans. Many Sarn officers angrily mused the monkey men, as humans were dismissively labeled, seemed to be born with the innate knowledge of how to launch a small craft from a larger craft. Some had begun to wonder if perhaps it was the human females who secreted away such knowledge and taught it to their little ones each night before sleep. This led to a suspicious reverence for human females bordering on paranoia, as tales of their telepathy and treacherous minds circulated, mutated, and took on a life of their own. Considerable effort was expended by Sarn officers to put down such whispers to no avail. The myth of the monkey witch persisted. The second dragon wasn't taken with imagined conspiracies and stories of how the humans would always be one step ahead. His more immediate concern was the security of his new base. The speed with which the Sarn had arrived in the El Rey system and constructed an underground facility on its outermost planet was calculated as the eventuality no human leader would believe. It put the Empire in striking distance of the Manassas defense matrix and put a major combat force on the doorstep of the Gitarn region. Knocking out the planetary defense base on ER-3 would cut Skywatch off and make it nearly impossible to reinforce positions like X-Ray and Uniform Tango. The way the humans described it, it would hem the enemy in. That was Orn's precise strategy.
once he had the upper hand, he would be in a position to call in his own ships of the line and open up a second front in the battle to deny Skywatch a secure perimeter in the outer systems. In the meantime, the unexpected arrival of an unescorted ship of the line only gave Orn and his hastily assembled command an even sweeter incentive. The only danger lay in the fact Citadel-class battleships had their own star wings. If they were going to hit her, it would have to be with overwhelming numbers, and it would have to be a surprise attack. Tell me more about the human commander hunter, Third Scale. He is well known among his people, a former fighter pilot and flight leader, born of a military family. Orn watched the biographical intelligence on Jason Hunter scroll by. It was spotty and occasionally inaccurate, but it painted a picture recognizable to an experienced officer. A young man, Orn mused, eager to make his mark. Yes, not very experienced, but apparently given to taking astonishing risks. I have reviewed the data on the battle over Bayon 3. Many casualties even though Captain Hunter's command survived. How reassuring it is to have such complete knowledge of my adversary's personality, the second dragon continued. A man given to taking risks could be dangerous. Hyval saw an expression of certainty dawn on the high noble's serpentine face. Orn glanced at the younger officer. But not as dangerous as a prepared opponent. You have new orders, Second Dragon? Open an encrypted channel to our electronic warfare frigate. I want the human scouts to see inexplicable images of our fighters in and near orbit. I want them to have a story to tell the young captain the kind of story that inspires him to imagine the glory of victory and the adoration of his sorceress females. Orn swiveled to indicate the largest display in the command center. Here, at the edge of the interdiction zone, momentary glimpses, third scale, inexplicable readings, scrambled data, draw hunters' scouts in, give them a mystery to solve, make them curious enough to approach. When Argent maneuvers close enough, we will spring our trap and return home with a prize for His Majesty.